love that, right? We were just talking about our identity in Christ, who we are. And, oh, yeah, she's written books, and she's an amazing speaker. But her big thing first was, well, I'm a wife and a mom, so I love that, Cindy. Um, she is a wife, a mom, a speaker, an author of these two books um, that I just mentioned. She is from Oklahoma, but wants you all to know she was from, I mean, she was from Texas, born in Texas. So it's okay, right? She's living in Oklahoma right now, but she's one of us. So, you know, we'd still love her anyway, I'm sure. The reason she's here is because Katie and Rebecca and I don't know who else read her books, devoured her books, loved her books, and said, we have to have her here. So that's how excited the team has been about having Cindy. Now, if you saw on the schedule, her name is not Belle, like the bells that just shut down. It's Beale. So welcome to the stage, Miss Cindy Beale. Thank you so much. Whenever she said Janet Jackson, how many of you wanted to say Miss Jackson if you're nasty? <laughs> Come on, 80 girls, 80s girls. That is awesome. Um, yeah, I am an 80s girl. I was graduated from high school in 1989. Anybody else happen to be there with me? Okay, I see a hand. I see your hand. God bless you. Very good. So eighth year to have this conference. It is impressive, so give it up for Rebecca and the rest of the ladies who have put this on. And I am so uh, thrilled to be able to be here and just share with you some stuff that God's shown me over the years. Um, I've got a family picture I wanna show you up there. It's, um, I have three sons and a husband and a daughter-in-law. Y'all, I got a girl. I finally got a girl, and I'm gonna be a grandmother in April. I know I don't look a day over 25, thank you, um, but I am. I just turned 50. We just celebrated 28 years of marriage. So um, yeah, that's my life and I'm excited. I, I wish I had the time to make all the cool slides like um, Aaron Walker did this morning. They were very impressive, Aaron, wherever you are. There you are, I see you. I didn't, but I started a new role in January um, at my church, at Life Church, which is in Oklahoma. And how many of you have ever heard of the YouVersion Bible app? Anybody by chance? If you have, yeah? So my church created that back in 2007, didn't create the Bible, okay, just, uh, <laughs> just the app, just the app for the phone. Um, and so I now work on the YouVersion team. I am the spiritual support leader. And so I started that in January, so that's why there's no fun slides. So I'm just gonna say I've been a little busy but I'm still excited to be here and I will try to talk relatively sl slow, but here's what I wanna tell you. I won't talk slow, I'm a, talk I'm a fast talker. But here's what I wanna tell you. I don't think you're gonna walk away from this today and last night with every single thing you heard that you're gonna have to apply. So what I want you to think about is what is the, the one thing or the two things that God wants you to take away, maybe from each speaker. So you can maybe thumb through your notes and go, oh, that's something I want to think through. So that's what I want you to do with mine. And think about the things, oh, I want to write that down. Or I want to write, type it in my phone. Um, I was listening at the very end of Heidi's talk. And she said that um, courage was, or encouragement is just basically kind of giving courage or there was an absence of something. I forgot what she said, but it, what'd you say? Yeah, that. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> but I've always said that encouragement is when you take some of your courage and you give it to another. You, it's a courage transplant. So I've got courage in my life from things I've walked through, just like most of you do. And so I want to give you some encouragement today. I want to give you a courage transplant. I want to be your CEO today, your chief encouraging officer. I want to do that today. Um, so one of the things with my boys, so they are my 20, he's almost, the oldest is almost 22, going to be a father. He's an old soul. He was old the day he was born. And, um, and then my next one's 18, and then my youngest is almost 17. And I am the shortest person, aside from my daughter-in-law and the family. But that the baby, his name is Seth, and he is 6'4", um, barefoot. And he, then he wears those 
shoes that all the kids wear, the young, the young people wear with the thick soles, and he's a giant, so I look up at him. And, um, but back when I turned 40, God had laid it on my heart to homeschool. And um, it was one of those things I was never going to do because I was a school teacher. I didn't want to homeschool my own kids. I did not want to do that. But my husband and I have been in ministry. He's a pastor, and he works weekends, and his day off was Friday. And it just the whole schedule of what we were going to have in the future years wouldn't have left a lot of family time. So we decided to homeschool. So when I took my kids out of public school to homeschool them, um, my friends who had been homeschooling basically said, hey, so don't expect to just go in on day one and start doing math or science. Just kind of ease into it. I'm like, no problem. So I thought, well, I'm going to just start reading to them. Big proponent for reading to your kids. And I started with Charlotte's Web. Great, great book. Great story. I go through the chapters, you know, probably a couple weeks in because I didn't read it all day. And get to the end, you know, and where, where Charlotte dies. By the way, I'm sorry if you haven't read the book. <laughs> Charlotte dies. <laughs> and I said, whatever the phrase was, and Charlotte died. Now, my oldest, he was listening, he was engaged. My youngest was doing somersaults all over the living room at any given time. And I said, and Charlotte died. And he looked up, who's Charlotte? <laughs> and that is how my homeschooling journey began super fun. Before we get into it, um, I just want to pray over this time. So if you'll bow with me, Father, we just love you and thank you that you are doing a work in each heart in this room and pray that you would continue that work as we go through each day and that we can be your light bearers and your hope bringers in this dark world. In Jesus name. Amen. So Proverbs 31, 25, you've heard it. This week, Pamela did a beautiful job this morning dissecting that, and um, I thought it would be fun to read through some different versions. That's one of my favorite things to do with a verse, is to take a different version and just kind of read through it. So let me just give you about four different versions here. So NIV says, she is clothed with strength and dignity, and she can laugh the days to come. A lot of us, that might be the, the version we use the most. The King James Version said, strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. And then there's the Amplified, which is a little bit lengthier, and I just love it. It says, strength and dignity are her clothing, and her position is strong and secure. I love that. And she smiles at the future, knowing that she and her family are prepared. And then, of course, there's the Passion Translation. It's one that I don't hold tightly to, but I sure like the way it kind of sums it all up for me. It says, bold power and glorious majesty are wrapped around her. I want you to picture that. They are wrapped around her as she laughs with joy over the latter days. I like the picture of the clothing, of something being wrapped, of literally putting on the clothing of strength and dignity. And just like Pamela uh, referenced some original Hebrew words, I'm just going to go through them real quick. She said that strength um, in the Hebrew, sorry, I'm trying to make sure my hair's not doing that. Uh, strength in the Hebrew is O's. O, it's apostrophe O Z. And it just means strength and might. And so this is the strength that is mentioned, this O's is mentioned 93 times in the King James Version of the, of the Old Testament. And this word is used to describe towers, talks about mountains. It's where God divided the sea, allowing the Israelites to walk across on dry land. It is, of course, the strength that is used to describe how powerful our God is. And guess what? As followers of Jesus, that strength is available to you. I want you to, to soak that in, that strength is available to you. That strength of God, the strength of the Almighty that it took to create the world and everything in it, the strength it took to part the Red Sea, the strength it took to cause the walls of Jericho to fall, the strength it took to impregnate a virgin 
so that the Savior of the world would be born and could fulfill prophecies. The strength it took to heal the sick, give sight to the blind, make the lame walk, raise the dead, feed the 5,000, calm the storm. The strength it took for our Jesus to be arrested unfairly. The strength it took for him to be betrayed by a man who said he'd follow him everywhere. The strength it took for him to be beaten and ridiculed and the strength it took for him to die an undeserved death. And then the strength it took to raise him to life again on the third day. That strength, so that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord would be saved, that strength, this O's, is available to us. When we seek him, when we need him, we can lean into him and he will offer that to us. So there are two kinds of women in this room. Those of you who are strong and those of you who know you're strong. Two kinds of women. There are those of you who are strong and those of you who know you're strong. So my question is, do you know that you're strong? Do you know how strong you are? Think back on your life, however long. You know, for me, it's just 25 years. So um, I was a, <laughs> think back to the disappointments, um, the hurts, the trials, the hurdles. They didn't take you out. You're still here. Did they disappoint you? Sure. Did they hurt? Probably. But you are here. You are still moving. You are still believing. You're still walking out your faith, even if it is bruised. You are stronger than you think you are. Because there will, and there will be future challenges. There will be future hurdles and trials and things that happen. I don't want to be Debbie Downer, but I'm just telling you, there will be. We live in a broken world. And they won't take you out either. Because you're stronger than you think you are. They'll disappoint you. They'll probably hurt. But you're going to be stronger after you go through them because you're still moving, you're still believing, you're still walking out your faith one day at a time. You are stronger than you think you are. What makes you strong? The strength of our God, the O's of our God, makes you stronger than you actually are. So when I tell you you're stronger than you think you are, I need you to understand that that strength is not in and of you. It is in and of him. 19 years ago, next month, my husband and I had just moved to Oklahoma, and we were, he was joining a team at Life Church to be a worship pastor, and we had just had nine, celebrated nine years of marriage, and so he was on the job, and I was getting unpacked and in our house, and one Tuesday morning, he came home, and he said, we need to talk, and so we sat down on our sofa, and he proceeded to drop everything on me that a woman never wants to hear. He told me he had been unfaithful to me with many different women in many different places at many different times. And it was almost as if I could hear my heart cracking open with every word he spoke. It was the worst day of my life. And little did I know the next day would still be the worst day of my life. And if all of that information that he told me that day wasn't enough, the final blow was one of the women was pregnant and he was pretty sure he was the father. And I literally found myself wishing I would die. And I am not being dramatic. I literally had a conversation with God and I said, if you could just take me in a car wreck while my son's not in the car, that would be great. I, can, I bargained with God to leave this earth. I said, I just don't think I can live knowing what I know. And I will tell you that my husband confessed to me because of the, the spirit of God, even through his sin, was bringing conviction, was the, the, the tension the abrasion of having amazing men and women around him who loved Jesus was getting to him, and he could not live that lie anymore. And in those moments, he told me, I will do anything, in anything 
to save our marriage. I will do anything you want. I will do anything to build your trust back. It probably won't happen, but if you'll give me a chance, I would love to try. And I know that some of you sitting out there, you think, gosh, I could never go through that. You know what? I said the same thing. I didn't know how strong I was. I didn't know how strong he was in me. Of course, we never think um, we're going to go through that, and, and I'm never going to be able to handle something like, that, something like that, and I could never, Cindy, do what you did. Trust me, I could never do what Cindy did either. That's how I felt when people would say that about me. And anytime someone hears of this far-fetched story, especially if I'm flying on a plane to speak somewhere and someone's, you go, what do you do when, you know, you speak? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or I'm ta- I tell them I speak and they're like, what do you speak about? Well, I've written a couple books. Oh, yeah, what are your books about? And then I tell them and they're like, crickets, you know. <laughs> they don't really know what to do with that because it's, you know, so, or they do know and then we have a great conversation. But it's a far-fetched story and people think, gosh, I could never ever do that. I could never go through that. I could never endure it. But I would tell you, I didn't know how strong I was because of the strength that was available to me. And I'm saying the same thing to you. So whatever is in front of you or whatever will be in front of you one day, you don't know how strong you are. You are stronger than you think you are because of him. I think about the preparation for the next season in our lives, those people who are um, maybe engaged, getting ready to be married, or maybe they are um, a couple's expecting a baby, or maybe it's a new career, right? Um, You can only read so many books, you can only attend so many conferences, you can only go through so many trainings, and you won't be prepared for what's ahead until you're in that season. Can you be prepared somewhat? Sure. But until you're a mom or a dad or until you're married or until you're in your new job, there are just some things that you won't know you can handle until you're in that role. And that's what I would say wherever you are in whatever predicament, you may think you can't handle what's coming next, but with the power of your God and your willingness to trust him, you will be stronger than you think you are. And it was in that season that I realized that I was stronger and I had the O's available to me and I want you to know that you are stronger than you think you are. I hope you remember that phrase. That's why I keep saying it. I want to settle in on dignity as we finish out this. Actually, I've got about three more hours of talking. Y'all good with that? Is that a problem? Just kidding. I won't do that to you. Plus, you just had lunch. So some of you are getting sleepy. So if I break out in a joke in about 15, 10 minutes, you'll know that I think you're probably nodding off. So we're going to settle in on dignity. And like um, we heard this morning, dignity means it's adar in, in the Hebrew language. And it means splendor, honor, majesty, all the things, the glory that we talked about this morning. And, and actually, Webster defines it as nobility or excellence. And so I think sometimes when we think of someone who is dignified, we think of someone maybe even in the royal family, unless you're watching The Crown, then it's like, oh, okay, that's weird. Um, they're not so royal. But, um, but, you know, we think of someone who is, you know, so proper. And, and so that's, where, that's what I think our minds do. So Adar is used 30 times throughout the King James Version of the Old Testament. And we see it in Psalm 29, 4. It says, the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty, or Adar. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. And Proverbs 20, 29 says, the glory of young men is their strength, and the beauty, the Adar, of old men is the gray head. So all of you with gray hair, look at you. You're full of dignity, and you don't even know it. (laughs) The same word, the same word Adar is used to describe God, and it's also used to describe this Proverbs 31 woman. Not because she was majestic or she was full of splendor, but because her God is. And it is him coming and living, his spirit living in us so that we can have that same splendor and honor and be full of 
full of glory, not, not a, a holy kind of glory like we're taking it from him. But as children of God, as daughters of the King of Kings, we carry his majesty. You see what I'm saying? We carry it. How do I know? Genesis 127 says we were made in God's image. It says in Ephesians 2.10 that we are his workmanship. We are his masterpieces. You're his masterpiece. He created you. He knew what he was doing. You are not junk. He didn't make a mistake. Everything about you, he knows you and he created you. And he is so proud to call you his piece of art. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us that when we come to Christ, the old is gone and the new has come. And we get this new self and Christ is living through us. Um, Colossians 3.10 says that this new self is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. And then, of course, Ephesians 4.24, the new self is created in, after the likeness of God. So you do carry his majesty he created you. He knows everything about you. And so with that in mind, why wouldn't we live our lives full of dignity? Why wouldn't we live that way? And what that means is we know who we are and we know whose we are. Those are the things we know when we are women living in strength and dignity. And so what does that look like? What does it look like to be clothed in strength and dignity? So let me ask, here's what I would say. What are you wearing? You're like, well, I just got this from Marshalls, TJ Maxx, or whatever, wherever you shop. That's kind of my go-to places. So um, what are you wearing? Are you um, a woman who is clothed in dignity, who carries the majesty of God, doesn't say that she's fat or skinny or tall, or short, or ugly, or useless, or stupid. She doesn't consider herself unworthy, or ill-equipped, or untalented, or undeserving, or disgraceful, or naive, or senseless, or irrelevant, or you fill in the blank that you've put on yourself. When we know that we have the strength and dignity from God, and we carry that majesty, it encourages us to rise above everything, to rise above every label we've ever put on ourselves and instead work through the insecurities, work through our pain, work through our struggles and all of the things that usually accompany when we have those labels, either in our minds or on our lips or in our hearts. So what does the woman of strength and dignity do? What does a dignified woman do instead? This might be a place where you have some note taking because I'm just gonna kind of throw some things out there. And this, as I was just kind of studying, I just thought, what is, if I'm a dignified woman, what am, how am I living my life? Like, what does that mean for me? And so the first thing that came to my mind, and it's actually in the next verse, um, is that she speaks wisely. A dignified woman speaks with wisdom. James 1, 5, if you know that passage, it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you can ask God and he will give generously to all without finding fault. And years ago when I knew God was calling my husband and I into full-time ministry, I was thinking, I am not that smart. Like, I don't think I can do this and answer questions and help people. And so I just began to pray a prayer. I saw this verse and I was like, well, I guess I'll, I guess I'll ask. And so I said, God, give me wisdom. Would you give me wisdom beyond my years? And I began to pray that prayer. And you guys, I can't even tell you how God just began to deposit wisdom into me. Because you guys, I was an average student in high school. In fact, you saw the books. They held the books up that I wrote. I need you to know that that's a miracle of God. And let me tell you why. So there are these little tests in high school, achievement tests. I don't even I think it was the California achievement test back when I was in high school. And I found my um, sheet, the score sheet. My mom actually found it and gave it to me a couple of years ago. And we got, there was math and r reading, I think, and then writing. Those were the three categories. Thank God there wasn't science because I would have totally failed that. Um, so there was math and it said, Cynthia, that's my name, Cynthia Pat, she met the minimum requirements for the state of Texas. And then, which is good. I mean, I passed. I mean, <laughs> pass or fail, I'll take the pass. So then the next one was reading, and it said, Cynthia met the minimum requirements for the state of Texas. I'm like, sweet, two for two. 
the writing part. It said Cynthia did not meet the minimum requirements for the state of Texas. And you guys, I've written two books. I was not a good writer. I knew some grammar, but I was not a good writer. And I'm telling you, it was everything about all of that was the supernatural. I can't even, I just did the natural and I said, okay, God, I'll do whatever. I'll dump, do dump. Okay, what are we going to do next? I would do the natural and he did the super. I did the natural and he did the super. And that maybe some of you need to hear that. So just know that the fact that where I am today, I still laugh sometimes with God and I'm like, people don't even know where I came from. People don't even know. Um, a woman, a dignified woman, a woman who is full of dignity, she, she is kind. She is kind. You know, sometimes our manner in saying something is worse than what we say. So here's what I would say. Say what you mean. Don't say it mean. And scene. Drop the mic. <laughs> say what you mean, but don't say it mean. Don't be mean. I mean, there are times I'm be like, oh my gosh, that dress is so ugly, but you are so cute. I mean, I would never say that to someone, but like, that's what I'm talking about. Just be nice. But don't really say someone's dress is ugly. Just say, yeah, let's find something else. Um, in the name of Jesus. Um, a woman who is dignified, a woman who walks in dignity, becomes self-aware. You guys, this is so important in life. Becomes self-aware. What does that mean? It means you're aware of yourself. Let me dive into that. You have an awareness about your shortcomings, and you aren't afraid to address them. It's just what Erin talked about this morning in her talk about you know, being um, with mental wellness. That is so important. It is having, knowing that you have shortcomings and not being afraid to address them. We are not perfect. Um, it is an awareness about your limitations, and you're not afraid to accept them. You guys, I have some limitations, and one of them is that in grade school, I always failed conduct. I either got an N for needs improvement or a U for unsatisfactory. And you guys, I have a delightful personality, and I still got that. <sighs> but I talk too much. Still, that's why I'm on stage and you're not. I talk too much. And I am not afraid to accept it and just admit it. And I'm still at age 50 working on it. I'm still at age 50. So just don't be afraid to address them. And the other thing is I'm probably not going to be a supermodel. <laughs> I mean, there may have been time, I never really wanted to, but like there was a time when I wanted to be on a recording, like a singing tour, like a singing group. Probably not going to happen, even though I, I can sing, but I'm not that good, you know? All right, so she has an awareness about her um, limitations, isn't afraid to accept them. She has an awareness about her strengths, and she celebrates them. Not arrogantly, I'm not saying go around and go, hey, do you know how awesome I am? I'm a blessing. I'm a blessing to the body of Christ. <laughs> no. That's what I'm talking about. I'm just saying, celebrate how God's wired you. If you are a bookkeeper, kind of nerdy spreadsheet person, by the way, I love you because I'm that person too. Don't be afraid to celebrate how that's how you're wired. There, this conference could not be, would not be happening without people behind the scenes making sure all the things happen. Right, Rebecca? I mean, things have to happen. It has to be well-oiled and a smooth thing. So celebrate your strengths. And then awareness about her challenges, and she isn't afraid to work through them instead of avoiding them. That's so hard, you guys. I know. I know it's so hard. But again, like any kind of growth that we want to have, just not just as women, but as followers of Jesus, we have to be okay with going through the hard things and addressing them. A woman of dignity apologizes and makes amends. I am really stepping on some toes. I hope you didn't wear sandals. She apologizes and makes amends. And if you think, well, Cindy, I'm not wrong, you need to go back up to the self-awareness part. <laughs> you need to say, oh, okay. So we all need to, my son is 
so hilarious. My youngest, he and I connect a lot, and obviously he's the one at home still. And one time, was, I mean, probably two years ago, maybe three, I, we kind of, you know, we have the same personality, so we can be feisty. And I just yelled at him, and I said everything that was true, but I just was not very nice and kind. I did not say it nice. And I came back in to apologize, and he goes, Mom, you always apologize. Just stop doing it. <laughs> and I'm like, gosh, I sure wish I could. If you weren't such a punk sometimes. <laughs> I did not say that, but I was thinking it right. <laughs> don't be afraid to apologize. Just, I'm sorry, man. Don't make an excuse. Don't do it if. Don't give me a big butt. Just, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. Um, a woman of dignity forgives others. A woman of dignity is not easily offended. If you want a good book, just listen or read. I'm a listener, so Unoffendable by Brant Hansen. It's a quick listen, a quick read, and let me tell you, it will really open your eyes. Don't think that everything someone says is about you. It's just not. I mean, if I walk around, I could be so offended. My husband's a pastor of a very large church. One of our churches at Life Church, we have 36 locations in 11 states, and so I could be really offended because someone's always disappointed with something we do or don't do. I just, you know what? It's okay. It's just where we are. So forgive. Just let people off the hook. Let them off the hook. A woman who is dignified never says that's just the way I am. I'm gonna, I'm gonna duck. Because I think someone's mad. <laughs> That's just the way I am. As long as you have breath in your lungs, there is an opportunity for you to grow. There just is. Why do you think I'm still trying to work on my, my talking? Still trying to work on things about me. And you know what? I don't know. I may be just that thing that is with me all through my years until I, you know, grow there and maybe, or I die. I will stop talking when I go to heaven. So there's that. <laughs> and the last one, a woman of dignity doesn't avoid grief. Yeah. Why do we avoid grief? Well, it hurts, for one. And number two, it hurts. <laughs> That's why. I mean, there's plenty of other reasons, but we avoid it because it's painful. And we don't want to relive it. And we want to sidestep grief. The problem is, as we're moving on the side, grief is still going to meet us right there. And so, just like Aaron said, you just or I think it was Aaron, or maybe it was Pamela, just walking through that grief and then dealing with it, and then, okay. All right, I had a moment. And let me tell you what I've found. In, in all of my life of grieving the losses that I've experienced, every time I would push through that grief, cry it out, deal with it, I was simultaneously healing. Like, I know that doesn't feel natural, but that is what is happening. And one day for me, I just didn't cry anymore about this particular situation. And I knew that, oh, okay, I cried all the tears, and okay, I think I was kind of through it. So don't be afraid to deal with grief. And here's, a, here's an analogy for you. Um, sometimes we don't see our progress through our hard times. So... And we can grieve on a lot of different areas. It doesn't have to just be the loss of a person. It can be the loss of a dream or an experience or whatever. Any, any loss, you're going to grieve. And so, I mean, kids graduating, going to college, you're, you're losing. It's going from one season to the next. It's okay. It's okay. It's a grieving time. So recognize that sometimes we don't always see our progress. And so God gave me this picture, actually, um, years and years ago when I was helping some other people walk through their marriage struggles. And I'm going to get back to my marriage story at the end. I'm going to hold it till the end so y'all are paying attention, just so you know. Uh, anyway, but like this picture he gave me was that, you know, we're driving in a car, right? And most of the time we should be looking through the, the windshield, right? It's, it's a big windshield. We need to look through it. But occasionally we glance at a rearview mirror, Side mirrors, we kind of glance just to see we're gauging our surroundings, right? Same thing with our progress through hardship and pain and grief. 
you're looking forward, you're pressing forward, but occasionally you need to look back and see how far you've come. You need to look back. You don't want to stare in the rearview mirror because you're not going to see the semi coming in on the exit, whichever side that is. The exit, you're not going to see that. You glance. Oh, I have made progress. Even if it's just five steps, you've made progress. And if anybody, you, you guys need to use that analogy, anything, you just take it. Take it. I bless you with it. So, uh, especially teenagers, they need some help, you guys. Um, <laughs> So these are just some things that came to me as I was thinking about a woman who is dignified and, 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 and grows through her limitations and shortcomings and the things that frustrate her and the things she wish she didn't do and the things she wish she didn't have to go through. And we do this because we respect ourselves as children of God. Um, we are stronger than we think we are. And we have God's power to assist us when we don't think we can push through that pain, when we don't think we can endure that situation. So back to my situation. You guys are probably wondering, wow, you told us, you left us hanging. Well, I'm a writer now. Hello, thank you. Uh, and apparently I'm a speaker, so I know how to leave an audience hanging, you guys. I'm not, I've done this a few times. Um, I'm just kidding. Um, so... I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, gosh, how do you even take a step forward, right? I mean, that's probably a lot of your thoughts. And so I just remember asking God, I don't even know that I asked him why at the beginning because I was just so shocked that my husband that we had done youth ministry and worship leading together for nine years, this is happening and we resi he resigned from his position. Um, he got a job at Home Depot. Um, I got a job actually at the church that he resigned from. And so I remember we were at home and we were, it was the first couple of weeks and I was just overwhelmed with what to do next. And so I actually left him, not left him, but like I took my son, I said, I just need some time away from you. And I had been begging God for that two-week period. I was like, God, I don't know what to do. Because here I am. I mean, it might have been more simple if he was a jerk. But he, you know, like, you're, I, you're, I did this because of you, and you didn't meet my need. I mean, he didn't say it. He was saying the right things. And I thought, well, of course, just because he confesses something to me doesn't stop my love for him. I still love him. So I decided to go down, come down to see my mom down in Georgetown. That's why I was raised and so she was really picky and like persistent was like you're gonna meet with my pastor and I'm like no I'm not she's like yeah you are I'm like no I'm not so when I got there I went to see her pastor um, <laughs> and uh, and I just remember thinking why am I here but then I ended up just kind of telling him everything that happened and he just um, he listened so kindly and it was he was such a kind man and at the very end, I think I was like wanting him to go, okay, here's your get out of jail free card. You're good. You can leave your marriage. I kind of think I wanted that, but then I kind of didn't, so I didn't really know. And so he just looked at me and he said, you are not a fool to stay and be a part of the redemptive work in a man's life. It's in my book. If you buy the book, you'll see that phrase. He said, you are not a fool to stay and be a part of the redemptive, man in a, redemptive work in a man's life. And so that was like the first thing that just was like, huh, okay, God, are you telling me to stay? Is that what you're saying? I mean, what are we doing? So I decided to then go see my friend who is actually here right now, Anna Maria. She is, um, I decided to come on down to San Antonio because we lived in San Antonio for about four years before we left and um, to go to Tennessee and then to Oklahoma. And I came to see her, and, you know, I'm just a hot mess. I'm just miserable. I'm just pathetic, and we're talking. And so, I mean, she's a tremendous friend, incredibly wise. And so I remember we went to her church that Sunday, and there was a guest speaker. And I thought, well, you know, we'll give it a try, because I really loved her pastor. I thought he was going to be the one to give me a word from God. I just thought... Billy knows, I mean, he knows Jesus, and if anybody's going to tell me something, it's that man. He wasn't there. <laughs> and do you remember that? 
And it was a guest speaker, and I was like, okay, well, worship happened. We were in worship, and I was crying. And then the speaker shared, and I cried all the way through the message. And I don't remember anything he said. And she leaned over to me, and she goes, that was so for you. I'm like, yeah. (laughs) And I don't remember anything. So we went, oh, oh, I almost left out the best part. I'm sorry, I've told the story a million times that I almost forgot the best part. So at the very end, the speaker said, I think we have someone who'd like to read a verse. It was a very small church, so it was not uncommon for it to be a little bit more kind of, you know, smooth and flowy and rough and all the, you know, it was just a small church. And she came up and she said, I want to read from Habakkuk 2.3. And she said, it, the Habakkuk 2.3 says, for the vision is yet for the appointed time, though it linger, wait for it. It will come and certainly not delay. And the moment she spoke that, I said, that's for me. That, that's my word. And all I know in that moment that I just felt like God was saying, I know you don't see. I know, I know you don't know how I'm going to use this. I know you don't know that 19 years from now you're going to be standing on the stage. He said, I know you don't know. So we left to go get lunch and to get Mexican food like any respectable Texan would after church. <laughs> and so we go and we sit and, and I tell her that verse was for me. And she's like, Okay. I mean, you guys, it's Habakkuk. I mean, (laughs) how many people read Habakkuk? I mean, I do, but not everybody does. At least it wasn't Leviticus, so we're safe there. (laughs) So that afternoon, we went to another friend's house, her friend, and we get to her house, and I'm telling her all about it. I didn't even really know this friend, knew of her. And I was telling her, and I'm crying still. I'm just a mess, y'all. I told you I was a mess. And she said, you know what? I think I want to share something with you. Let me go get my Bible. I'm like, great. She comes back in and she says, so this morning I was reading Habakkuk 2 and verse 3 jumped out at me. And I was like, do what? What'd you say? What you talking about, Willis? You know? Um, And I just, that afternoon, God was like, do you trust me? I don't care if you trust him. Do you trust me? You told me you trust me all your life. Do you trust me? This is where the rubber hit the road with my face, and I either had to do what I said I believed all these years, or I didn't. And you guys, the moment I said, okay, God, I trust you. So this was literally almost three weeks from the time he confessed to me. And I said, okay, I trust you. And you guys, the spirit the supernatural peace of God just flooded me and covered me and drenched me and drowned me. It is unexplainable. It is unfathomable. I cannot tell you anything but in more detail except that I knew that I was called to stay. So I stayed. I went back home two days later and we began the process of pushing through the pain and crying, pushing through more pain when I had to go get, we both had to get tested for STDs and AIDS and other things. I pushed through the pain when that baby was born. I pushed through the pain when that little boy would come to visit us. He was in that picture. He's my middle one, my 18-year-old, and I don't call him a stepson. He's just my boy, and he loves me, and he calls me Mama Cindy, and he is a true delight to our family. We have had hard times. It has been hard for him not to have a dad present because we're eight hours apart, but we do everything we can to be available to him, his mom, his grandma. And he is amazing. And I would have, I could have missed it if I had not sought God through all of this. I'm stronger than I thought I was. Not because Cindy Beale is so strong, but because my God is so strong. 
and I chose to address the things that were hard so that, so that I could become a better version of myself after it all. And so I know that some of you sitting in this room, you, you may have a story similar to mine, you may have a story that's not similar to mine, you may have something come up in your future and you may say, gosh, I really want it to turn out like Cindy's. Like, I want, my, I want a pretty bow on things. I want it to all be pretty and perfect. And so the, the, for me, if I could tell you this, my journey was not about a healed marriage. It was about a healed me. And so that's what I want for you. I want you to be a woman who walks in strength and dignity and who knows who she is and knows who she belongs to and even if anyone else's actions don't line up with them um, or their choices don't make your life easier or things just still are hard for you, I want you to be healed. I want you to be whole because you don't have to rely on someone else's choices to get there. It is between you and your God. And my question is, do you trust him? Do you trust him? Because he is good and he is faithful and he is righteous and he has good plans for you and he wants so much for your life and he wants you to give everything to him and he wants you to trust him and he wants you to trust him and he wants you to trust him and I'm just standing here as a woman who trusted him I don't have any initials after my name except MRS or they're in front of my name <laughs> I'm just here the only expert opinion I have is my own about my story, and I'm just here to tell it. And so this is my testimony. Some of you are still in your test. You're waiting for your money. <laughs> Don't give up. Don't give up. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your goodness. I thank you for being a God who's trustworthy because men and women all around us will fail we will fail, but you are true and right. And I pray that you would overwhelm us with your, your presence. May we be aware of your presence. May we drink you in and may we know you deeply and know that your everlasting arms are carrying us and comforting us every single day of our lives. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.